All right, I'm gonna get started now. Um, I'm Tasha Snow, I'm one of your co-conveners and Kaya Riverman is your uh, other convener for this. Welcome to the Waste Workshop. This is the ocean session and we have four speakers for you today and a 20 minute discussion at the end. Each speaker will talk for about eight minutes and there will be two minutes for questions and transition at the end. And um, for each of the speakers, we'll give a one minute warning at the seven minute mark so you know where you're at. Um, for everyone's information, the session is being recorded and it'll be put on YouTube at a later date. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any questions before we get started? Cool. Kaya, right, you want to start us off? Yeah, so our first talk is going to be, um, excuse me, by a, oh, his screen filled my screen. It's Andy Thompson. Sorry about that. Uh, Andy, tell us, tell us all about the ocean. Yeah, no worries. Sorry about that, Kaya. All right. Thanks, Kaya and Tasha for organizing. Uh, this all sounds good and looks good. Yep, great. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the Antarctic coastal current and what I'm going to try to look at is sort of its connectivity throughout West Antarctica. Um, this is work that came out of a research cruise we did in 2019, uh, but it was really led by a master's student, Ryan Schubert, at Florida State University, and uh, here are some of the collaborators on this. So I wanted to start by showing an overview picture of the circulation of the West Antarctic Peninsula. Um, this is a really nice schematic from a paper by Carlos Moffat and Mike Meredith. And one of the common features that we talk about is the sort of uh, approach of the southern boundary of the ACC and warm circumpolar deep water uh, towards the shelf break, and then that flow of warm circumpolar deep water towards the coast. But what happens when you get close to coast is there a second circulation feature, which is shown in yellow here, which is a southward flowing uh, coastal current. And this is a schematic of that coastal current. Notice that it can be tracked all the way south along the peninsula, and when it reaches the Bellinghausen Sea, its fate is a little bit unclear uh, in this schematic. Um, a lot of this comes from work that Carlos led on the West Antarctic Peninsula. Of course, this is a region uh, that is, is fairly well studied, and so I'm showing on the right-hand side here a section of temperature salinity that's extending from the coast. It's that solid black line in the map. And you can see near the coast, you have this reasonably cold, but, but very fresh and buoyant layer that sits near the surface. And in particular, that modifies the density surfaces such that you get a strong geostrophic flow, which is shown in the uh, bottom panel. So it's a southward flow and it's a, a quite narrow boundary current. And so as I said, this current's been fairly well studied uh, in the region of the West Antarctic Peninsula. And one of the things we were curious about is what happens when it gets into the Bellingshausen Sea. Now, uh, so there's that buoyant fresh water in the boundary current. Uh, Bellingshausen Sea has uh, a lot more, oh, sorry, a lot less traditional observations than say the West Antarctic Peninsula, um, but we've been able to use uh, instrumented elephant seal data to start looking at the distribution of this boundary current. So let me give you a sense of just how much data there is. Uh, to orient yourself on the bottom, I'm showing a map of the bathymetry in the Bellingshausen Sea. So on the right, you have the Western side of the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, and in particular, Marguerite Trough. And as you move south, the Bellingshausen Sea is dominated by two major troughs, the Latady Trough to the east and the Belgica Trough to the west. So those are those dark orange regions labeled LT and BT. And we're looking at data that spans 2007 to 2014. And you can see this pretty remarkable coverage, some 30,000 profiles. Uh, you know, the quality of these are not as good as ship based CTDs, but the coverage is, is excellent. Um, and even when you start looking at the seasonality of these distributions, they're pretty good. So in the summer months, you tend to get more profiles near the coast. Uh, in the winter months, it's quite interesting how the profiles and the seals congregate around the shelf break. Uh, and that's kind of interesting to pursue. But this does give us a sense of sort of a broad average picture uh, of what we're seeing in the Bellingshausen Sea. And so what Ryan did, that was quite nice. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about kind of these first pictures, but with these different hydrographic profiles, what we could actually do is start looking at spatial maps of properties. So what Ryan did was actually interpolate the data, which is obviously collected as a function of depth, onto different density surfaces. And I'm just giving you an example here of, of what one of those might look like. So this would be a density surface that sort of sits uh, at the boundary between the upper ocean uh, and sort of the uh, winter water layer and what sits below in the circumpolar deep water layer. 
And I just want you to note sort of the, the properties along the coast, because that's the area we're going to focus on. And there's this very clear signature of both a cooling as you move from east to west, so the southern part of the West Antarctic Peninsula, uh, into the Bellingshausen Sea and off towards the Amundsen Sea, uh, and a freshening as well. And one can do this on different density surfaces, which you know looks at different water masses. Um, and it, due to the shortness of the talk, I'm not gonna talk about that too much. But the other thing that you can do with the map that's really interesting is if you choose a reference level, you can actually calculate something called the dynamic height, which is essentially the integral of the density field. And that gives you a reference, or it gives you a horizontal velocity uh, with respect to some reference. So here, essentially what I'm showing you is a map of dynamic height uh, which is proportional to uh, the pressure grade, oh, sorry, the pressure field, and its gradient is thus proportional to the geostrophic velocity. Um, what you're seeing here is that this dynamic height field is uh, highest and has its larger values all along the coast, and then it drops off quite rapidly as you move away from the coast. And it's that strong gradient that's indicative of the flow field and that, that strong coastal boundary current. And so using this dynamic height field, we can actually look at sort of a, a horizontal picture of what those boundary currents look like. And you can see very clearly that that coastal current flows in at the southern boundary of the West Antarctic Peninsula where the Moffat schematic ended and flows all along the coast in front of all of the ice shelves in the Bellingshausen Sea. So George Stick, Stange, Venables. And then when you get off to the west towards Abbott, the bathymetry gets there quite shallow and you can sort of see this flow field moving back towards the shelf break. And um, if people have questions about that, that's kind of an interesting. Uh, picture. The other thing that we can do with this data set that I, I think is also quite insightful is not look at horizontal variations, but also sort of look at progressive vertical variations. So the second thing that, that Ryan did was quite nice is he created these composite sections. So took a sort of a rectangular region that was largely perpendicular to the coast and took all the profiles and averaged them into, into hydrographic sections. And what I'm going to show you is the progression of those properties, again, as you move from east to west through the peninsula uh, and the Bellingshausen Sea. So again, to orient yourself what, what this might look like, right? you would have a section uh, that's an average section and you can kind of do nice error analysis because you have all of these different uh, profiles that have been averaged. As a function of depth and latitude or, or distance offshore, here uh, the warm circumpolar deep water is sitting offshore that's on your left and the colder water uh, or the coast is on your right. And again, I think the, the striking field to look like is the salinity field. And you see again, hugging right up along the coast on the right-hand side uh, is this low salinity buoyant layer uh, near the surface. And you can see that it shapes the ice signals under them such that you get sort of a tilting of the density surfaces. And, and I'll come back to this. Um, in a short talk, I, I don't have a lot of time to go through the details, but if you just sort of look at these sections, there's a really nice signature in pretty much all of the properties. So, in all of these plots, you'd focus on the right-hand side, which is near the coast. As you move from east to west, you see a cooling. Uh, you see a freshening. That's very, very clear on the right-hand side of the salinity pictures. Uh, I think what's exciting, though, is you also see an intensification of the stratification, so the vertical buoyancy gradient at the base of the coastal current. Um, and then you also see a deepening of this layer. One minute, Andy. Thank you. Yep. And so with the kind of the last thing to show here is with the density surfaces, one can also uh, calculate the geostrophic velocity. Again, we have referenced them to uh, 400 meters depth. So the lower panel here is just showing what those geostrophic velocities look like. Blue is a southward flow, so it's flowing towards you. And now we can actually integrate the transport, the volume transport across uh, the section. And so if I go to my last result here, I think this is kind of the, the key result. As I look, as we calculate the transport across the different sections, so one through seven, which is sort of flipped, so you go, I've written that wrong. You go from east to west, sorry. So as you go from the Antarctic Peninsula through the Bellingshausen Sea, you almost have a linear increase in the volume transport uh, all throughout the Bellingshausen Sea. And so I think what this, success, what this suggests is that the strengthening of the coastal current as you move through the Bellingshausen towards the west is a signature of an increase in glacial meltwater. Now, the increase in the volume transport isn't just to the meltwater alone. It's actually in training glacially modified uh, meltwater. And so it has this suggestion here that, that the coastal current is playing a role in sort of the three-dimensional overturning circulation on the shelf. So very quickly, implications. One, I think that the fact that you're modifying the stratification in front of these ice shelves could have an important role for the partitioning of heat that gets into ice shelf cavities. Uh, and this has been talked about by uh, uh, Silvano and his colleagues. 
Um, and then because this impacts the surface layer, there's also been discussion of shallow melting in some of these ice shelves. So this paper by Stewart in Nature Geoscience, looking at the Ross ice shelf. And Yoshi is going to talk later in the session, uh, also has some nice evidence that these, these coastal properties may impact uh, dense shelf water formation. So put my conclusions up and stop there. Thanks. We have time for a question or two. Yeah, hi, this is Torsten. Maybe I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I don't understand it too much. So you have this um, fresh layer, fresh cold, um, and a layer on top. And I guess that makes the stratification very stable. So mm -hmm. how, why is then, if, if the volume increases as it goes south, how does it modify the stratification? I think it sounded to me that, that it's uh, very stable throughout. Yeah, so that's, so that's right. It, that is always a relatively stable layer. I did not have time to show uh, plots of n squared, so the, the vertical stratification, the front by frequency. Um, but there is a strengthening of this. And I think very simply what's ha happening is two things, right? Is you are progressively becoming more buoyant because the water is becoming fresher. But actually, the actual volume of that layer is increasing. And so you essentially stretch or fill the volume of that uh, density class. That does two things, right? It increases the sea surface height which drives a stronger geostrophic flow, but through sort of thermal windshield or pushing those density surfaces down, that also uh, sort of increases the stratification at depth. And presumably, I think that what I'm trying to hint at here is that could have an impact on the vertical heat fluxes. So the extent to which warm circumpolar deep water might escape vertically and be ventilated through the atmosphere as opposed to circulating under the ice shelves. Yeah. All right, thanks so much. That was helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Andy. Um, as we transition to the next speaker, you have a question in the chat as well from, from Rob Larder. Okay, let me see if I can stop sharing. Um, uh, there we go. Okay, so next up, we're going to be hearing from Yoshi Nakayama. Um, Yoshi, go ahead and share your screen. Oops, you were sharing it for a second there and then we lost you. I know, I, I, I was not sure how to unmute, unmute myself, so I decided to unmute first and then. You guys see my screen now? We can, yep. Good. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I've, I've been working on the ocean modeling for Amundsen Sea and the Rating Housing, oh, sorry, the East Antarctic, West Antarctic ice shelves. Uh, focusing on ice shelf ocean interactions, and I thought I have a few, few domains now currently under development, and I thought it may be a good idea to summarize what I have been doing for, for now. So um, these are the four ongoing developments uh, which I've been working with my students and my, uh, my collaborators. I have been working on the new thing is uh, the, the East Antarctic domain uh, covering Totten Ice Shelf and also Cape Downey domain, but this is base meeting, so I'll, I'll spend most of my time Oh, uh, to talking about this Amundsen Bering Housing Sea Domain, and there's uh, one tiny, um, tiny domain that that is the uh, I'm not sure how if you guys can see my mouse, but uh, there's a tiny domain which is the Amundsen Sea, including Twaits, Pine Island, and Dawson Crossing. So uh, looking at this uh, Bering Housing Amundsen Sea Domain, the big red things covering Bering Housing Amundsen. Uh, so this is one of the um, example model outputs. Uh, so I, this is based on Nakayama et al. 2018, but we actually extended the simulation from 1992. This is the work I've been working with my student Shuntaro, uh, and, and uh, this, this is mostly done by him. Um, we actually updated the simulation, extended the simulation from 1992 to 2016. We have now daily and mo monthly outputs available. This simulation is forced by, um, oh, sorry. This simulation is forced by echo boundary, so which means that we, I have the boundary condition from the state estimate at, at the northern and the western boundaries. And I've been running this simulation using era interim forcing. So here I'm showing you, this is the example temperature field at 552 meter depth. And you, you of course, you see the warm water intrusion towards, uh, for example, Pine Glacier here and Thwaites. And also in the Bedinghausen Sea, uh, we, we also see some intrusion towards ice shelf cavities. 
one, one development that we actually have been doing with Shintano is that we are trying to, as Andy has talked nicely about Willinghausen C, now we also discovered that there are some data that we can actually compare with observations. So I'm going to spend a few minutes about how these models, since I've been only working on Munzen C using this model outputs, so we are now doing some model evaluation looking at Willinghausen C. So looking at this vertical section located right here, uh, this is the model. This is the model outputs. Uh, oh, sorry. So there, there are a few different troughs, the DT and then uh, LT. And then there's another trough, which is important carrying this warm salty circumpolar deep water uh, towards actual cavities. And if you look at the vertical section, uh, it looks like this. Uh, we have the um, warm, warm water uh, sitting at the depth. And there's, uh, of course, uh, the shallow, at the shallow depth, there's a cold winter water sitting there. Um, so we are able to simulate warm water intrusion towards our shell cavities, and this is the data. So here I'm showing you the March 27 monthly mean um, uh, for the model, and for observations, this is the data which is taken in the March 2007. So when you open up the, the data, as you see the points here, and, and, um, and the model, we are, we are able to see that the, although there are some biases for different sections, we are able to simulate circumpolar deep water intrusion quite well, consistent with, consistent with observations, and um, we are quite happy about this. So we decided, okay, let's try to understand well, what are the pathways of circumpolar deep water towards these ice shelf cavities. So we actually tested, we released particles under the ice shelf and uh, tracked, uh, tracked these particles uh, for, for roughly one year. Here I'm showing the animation uh, extending for, for a year and actually, I, I, we've done this from, for, we released the particle from each year at the, under the ice shelf and, and try to understand the, the pathways. And actually, we find out that in, in any cases, from, from, we didn't see so much year to year variations. That's why I'm actually showing this is the pathways which are we calculate from the, the, the mean field, which basically means that this is the mean, mean stru structure of how circumpolar deep water uh, flows towards the ice shelf cavity. So we actually see that there's a bathymetric features, which is, uh, important determining the pathways of circumpolar deep water towards our shell cavity, which is quite similar to, to the case in the moons in sea. So this is some updates. Also here, so if you calculate the, the transports through the different troughs, uh, for example, the Liga trough, which is about roughly 1.4 terawatts per month, and uh, we are now still analyzing further uh, for, for, the, for the model output in the Bellinghausen sea. So getting back, getting back to the moons in sea, I, I, I thought it may be a good idea to uh, talk a little bit about the updates about Amundsen C simulation as well. So I have this big simulation uh, running for this large domain extend from 1990 to 2016. And I also have tiny domain, which is located here. We are actually running uh, 200 meter resolution only for two months, but we, we are able to capture many small scale processes as well as even the, even the pathways of um, second polar depot into the actual cavity and towards the guiding line. So here, this is a tiny domain. This is a pine island. This is Thwaites, Dots and Clausen. And this is, I'm showing you potential temperature at 27.75 isopicnol. You see that there's a warm water, which is uh, flowing along the, the, the isobath. And it flows into the actual cavity. It takes roughly like 30 days from here all the way to the actual front. Here's a, here at the bottom panel, I'm showing you the, the Passive tracers, which is also mimicking the second polar deep order. And you also see that there's a warm water. It takes like, takes like 30 days to the ice shelf front, and it takes another 30 days or so uh, for the second polar deep order to reach the ice shelf cavities and towards the Ghana line. We think these, the, the, these data sets are quite useful. For example, we are able to look at the vertical section under the ice shelf. For example, if you cut the section underneath the ice shelf, some, some, something like here, uh, it looks like this. And you can actually see that there's a, there's a current which is hugged by bathymetric features, which is responsible. This is the ocean current. This is the temperature here, field here. So the ocean current, so we actually see that, oh, there's an ocean current which is hugged by the, bound, the bathymetric features, which is important for carrying circumpolar deep water uh, towards the granny lines. At the same time, at the bottom panels, actually we released particles uh, model simulated particles, and we actually calculated the pathways of particles at the location where uh, Keith Nichols and David Horan was planning to deploy the, uh, the floats. So we think that the, these model outputs can be utilized for many different purposes, including observation plannings, uh, boundary condition for ice models and ocean models as well. So I thought 
Okay, so I thought it may be a good idea to summarize what kind of outputs are available, and I have everything available. Some of them are through website, some of them through upon request. But um, so I thought it may be a good idea to summarize all, all, all of them so that if, if one is interested, I'm very happy to share any of the outputs. So for the big domains, the Munzen C domain, I have 1992 to 2018, which is three to four kilometer monthly and daily up outputs available from 2001 to 2016. For the high risk domain, this is only available for, for two months, 2010 January to March, and daily and hourly data is available. Just one minute. Oh. Oh, seven minutes? Just one. Yep. To sum up, uh, so the, the, my goal is to, to, my research goal is to develop a reliable ocean model that is able to simulate the current hydrographic conditions as well as past observations. We are trying to compare as best as we could uh, in the, part, the previous publications and ongoing publication to compare with the data. These model outputs can be utilized, I think, for many different purposes and more updates to come. Uh, these model outputs are available, or uh, I'm happy to share any of my outputs upon request. Um, so, thanks. Thanks so much. We have time for a question. This is Laurie Padman. The, uh, I was wondering about the basal melting uh, for the Pine Island and Thwaites areas. How, how well are you doing on that? Um, I mean, they're, they're, if, you, if you think about the magnitudes, then we, we are still able to adjust, for example, the drug coefficient or something like that. So um, I don't know how to frame that. Uh, in, in terms of gigaton per year, we, we are slightly, I mean, for, for some runs, it's slightly underestimated, but it's not too far. Off. When you look at the spatial patterns, um, the granite line melt rates that we, I get is roughly 100 meter per year, the maximum, and observations, uh, David Shen, he showed roughly 150 to 100, which may include some, some error, but still uh, maybe slightly, under, uh, it may be underestimated by half at the location at the granny line, which may be related to the fact, the fact that we are maybe not resolving still the steepness of the slope or maybe different processes that we don't resolve. Okay, thanks. Okay, any further questions we can talk about in the discussion at the end. So Yoshi, if you could end sharing your screen, yeah. And next up we have Mike Dinneman. Okay. at the beginning. Um, thanks, Kaya. Uh, I'm going to present some work we've been doing on how ice shelves affect nutrient supply for prior production around Antarctica. And um, just a quick introduction. The Antarctica shelves um, are only a small percentage of the area of the Southern Ocean, but they have the highest prior productivity per unit area, and they can be really important sinks of carbon dioxide. Now, there's several factors that are controlling primary production on the shelf, but the two they're going to matter the most are going to be light limitation and micronutrient limitation. And we're talking about micronutrient, micronutrient limitation when we're talking about dissolved iron. Um, now people think that the Antarctic ice shelves are going to be important to dissolved iron supply to the um, well-lit surface um, waters over the open continental shelf. But exactly how this works or how this might change is still an open question. Um, the plot on the left now is just um, a climatology of um, satellite estimate of uh, surface chlorophyll. And you can see the big red bullseye around Antarctica. So you can see the really productive waters in general. And there have been a lot of possible sources of dissolved iron supply in the surface waters we've been talking about. Um, circumpolar deep water, which comes out of the shelf at depth, but can get mixed in the surface, um, has a fair bit of dissolved iron in it. Um, idea is that there's um, dissolved iron in the glacial ice itself. And when this ice melts, whether it's floating ice or maybe the grounded ice, dissolved iron gets in the meltwaters and get out into the open continental shelf. Um, sediment sources could be important, melting sea ice, atmospheric deposition, hydrothermal iron. And so the pictures on the right now is just, uh, from a study by Kevin Arrigo and others. 
And what they were doing were just correlations between um, satellite estimates of chlorophyll and several plenies all around the coast of Antarctica and different physical parameters, things like number of days the plenty is open, integrated light, sea surface temperature. And the strongest correlation by far, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but down here on the bottom right was between the satellite chlorophyll and the basal melt rate of adjacent ice shelf. So this um, helped people with the idea that, okay, the ice shelves are gonna be really important to climate reduction. And maybe they're important because they're supplying dissolved iron. Um, now, originally a lot of thoughts were that uh, the impact of the ice shelves was that there was a lot of dissolved iron in the meltwater itself. But other people have thought um, that it may just be circulation changes driven by the um, ice shelf melt that affects this. And one area where this was looked, there was a big observational program in the Amundsen Sea Plenty in front of Dotson Ice Shelf. And then there was some modeling done there by Pierre Saint Laurent. And um, the important part of the um, ice shelf melting and the modeling he was doing was this melt water pump um, circulation. So you get melting at the base of the ice shelf and that can drive, an, and that melt water is buoyant, it can drive an overturning in the ice shelf cavity. In Pierre's model, he found that the ice shelf meltwater pump overturning a deep source of dissolved iron was actually more important than the direct supply from ice shelf meltwater itself. So we want to look at this around the whole Antarctic. And so we have a five kilometer resolution model. It's an ocean circulation model. It's got sea ice in it. It's got um, floating ice shelves, um, similar to what Yoshi Ohm's model is. And in our model, we um, used a bunch of different tracers to look at the different sources of dissolved iron in the surface waters. Um, we had eight different sectors of ice shelf melt water that we were tracking. Um, these boxes are just showing the different sectors. And, and the heavy black shaded areas are the ice shelves in the model. Then we had two sediment tracers. Um, and the reason we had two was we wanted to track um, the impact of the um, melt water overturning um, on the um, iron supply. And this is a model. We can just turn off the ice shelves if we want to, or the ice shelf melt. If you do that, you really screw up the circulation. And so instead, I stole an idea from Pierre where what he did was one of his tracers, when it went into the ice shelf cavity, he would just zero it out. So effectively turning off the effect of the ice shelf pump, not actually turning it off on the physics. So we have two sediment tracers, we have two CDW tracers, one of which reports zero in the cavities, and two sea ice melt tracers. And then just note that when we're calculating the total iron supply, it's going to depend a lot on the estimates of the end member concentrations. And some of these end member concentrations we know pretty well, actually, like CDW, but some of these, we, um, there's a lot of slop in the number. Also, we didn't have a full biology model in the simulation, but we did do some idealized scavenging biological uptake. And then one source that we didn't do here that we really want to do in the future is how important might the grounded ice melt be. Um, that melt water might have a fair bit of iron in it. And even though compared to the ice shelf melt water, um, volume may be low, it may be significant for the salt iron supply. So um, what these two plots are now showing, it's the model average dissolved iron concentration in the surface layer over the Antarctic continental shelf with different sources. And what we did was the model was run for five years with just physics. So you can see the different sources building up in the surface layer. And then after year five, we turned on biology so when the lights come on, we actually uptake the nutrients in the surface layer. And then um, when you um, get into the fall and the lights go down, we um, turn off the biology and, or the fake biology and let physics build the concentration back up. So this plot here on the right is just a blow up of the last two years. And you can see that averaged over the entire continental shelf, the sediment and CDW source is gonna matter the most. This varies depending on where you look, but in general, it will matter the most. Sea ice still matters in the, direct input of ice shelf melt water was less important. Again, average around the continent. There's some areas where it was very important. Now, if you look at the difference between the solid and the dashed lines, that's showing the difference in those concentrations when you zero out the sources when you get in the ice shelf cavities. So you can see that the sediment dissolved iron that gets to the surface is actually reduced by half when you zero it out in the ice shelf cavities. And the CDW um, dissolved, dissolved iron is reduced by a third. So the ice shelf cavity overturning is in the mean pretty important. Now, all this stuff was in a paper that just came out in JGR a couple of months ago. But now we're doing some new stuff where we want to um, see what um, idealized changes in atmospheric um, conditions might do. So we're not forcing the model with, say, you know, CMIP-5 projection. But in this particular case, 
we ran a new simulation where we um, increased the winds and shifted them forward um, based on some stuff that Paul Spence did. And when the numbers that Paul used, he was looking at CMIP 5 projections out to um, 2100. So it's, you can consider what the winds might be in 2100. And if you look just at the physics of the model solution, you can see this is the September sea ice, so the largest extent of sea ice. And with the just increased winds, not changing the temperature of the precipitation of the atmosphere, um, you can see we get a Waddell Sea pulling in. You can also see there's actually less um, ice along East Antarctica. And so some indication there's something going on with vertical mixing. And then um, if you look at the total ice shelf basal melt, it increased by 70%. But where it increased, you know, varied a lot around the continent. Like there's a lot of increase here in Queen Maud Land, a lot in the Abbott, um, sorry, Abbott Ice Shelf, um, not so much in Ross Ice Shelf. Like that's one minute. Okay. Um, well, looking really quick in what happens with the dissolved iron supply, um, the solid line now is dissolved iron supply when we change the winds. The dashed lines are the dissolved iron supply with the base case. And you can see that all four sources of dissolved iron increase when we increase the winds. Um, and the mean increased by about 50%. The one that increased the most was sediment by 200%. And then this figure on the right is just showing the ratio. And you can see that around almost all the continent, the dissolved iron surface layer increases when you mess with the winds, other than the Ross Sea for some reasons that we're still trying to figure out. But the important thing to note is the portion of the sediment contribution that transits through the ice shelf cavity um, was actually reduced when we um, changed the winds. So for the sediment, it went from 50%, went through the ice shelf cavity to about a third, and the CDW reduced somewhat too. So basically when we change the winds, the ice shelf melts increasing, and the dissolved iron supply is also increasing, but the portion of the dissolved iron supply related to the ice shelf melt and the melt-driven overturning actually decreases. And since I'm just about out of time, I'm just gonna leave uh, these summary slides up. Um, and thanks to NSF for support. Thanks. Questions for Mike? I'll, I'll ask one. Um, kind of really nicely from Yoshi's talk that preceded yours, Mike, you see um, that the bathymetry plays an important role in sort of focusing the circulation on the shelf pretty much, you know, in the Bellingshausen, but everywhere else. Do you see, are these places where more sediments are getting up into the water column when they're interacting with sort of the, the slopes of the troughs? Um, in very short areas somewhat, but usually the bigger control on the um, sediment source, if it's not going through the ice shelf cavity, just direct sediment source, yeah. is vertical mixing. Because there's some places, the deep shelf water formation regions, where you can get, you know, um, like in the Western Ross or um, right in front of the Dell, you can actually get mixing almost all the way to the bottom. And so that can get it directly into it. But a lot of the way, especially like in the Amundsen Sea, the only way you're going to get um, sediment of the iron is it has to go into the ice shelf cavity and get overturned. So it comes out in the meltwater um, closer enough to the surface that it can get to the surface. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much. Um, other questions we can hold for the discussion. Next up, we have our one and only convener, Tasha Snow. Great, thanks, Kaya. All right, so I'm going to share my screen here. All right, um, I put a box at the bottom for a speaker video here. If you want to minimize those videos and put that there, they will not um, interfere with the talk. Um, thank you for joining for my uh, presentation here. I wanted to start by acknowledging all of my collaborators listed here, as well as um, our funding agencies and the International Plates Glacier Collaboration, um, where a lot of this data that I'm going to present has um, come from. I'll be talking to you more about the Antarctic coastal current, but this time in the Eastern and Munson Sea, um, after you've heard um, from Andy about the Bellingshausen. Um, in general, the Antarctic coastal current uh, is, is, um, has, is found around a lot of Antarctica, as Andy said. Um, it's south of the circumpolar current, but um, often along the coastline, but it's not really clear 
in some locations, if it's always along the coastline, um, it generally has fast and shallow westward flow. And um, as we've already heard about, it can affect the heat transport to the ice shelves. Um, some work has been done in the Western and Munson Sea, shown here, that um, shows the Antarctic coastal current at the surface with this low salinity layer. Um, this has largely been not done in the eastern part of the Amundsen Sea, and so that's the work that we're doing here. The data sources that we're using um, include shipboard measurements of ADCP, the ocean velocity, which I won't show in this presentation. There's shipboard CTD data um, for temperature and salinity, as well as from uh, ocean gliders, seal tag CTDs, and a lot of what I'm contributing here um, is sea surface temperature data from MODIS, which is four kilometers uh, spatial resolution, as well as from Landsat, which is 60 and 100 meter resolution from Landsat 7 and 8, respectively. Um, Landsat 8 takes a lot of processing to get sea surface temperatures at the moment, um, an atmospheric correction and um, some cloud masking. I won't be showing much of that here. I'll show you a teaser at the end. but. Um, that is going to be available with this work later. Mostly what I'll show is MODIS. So we're bringing all of those together to kind of um, constrain what the properties are of the AACC um, in the Eastern and Munson Sea. Over here on the left, I'm showing a MODIS sea surface temperature image from February uh, 2010. This year, um, that year, the, the surface was largely sea ice free. Um, even up here um, in the east, that sea ice was gone later um, in February and March. And what we can see from that is um, warm sea surface temperatures in red, as well as the cool sea surface temperatures um, in the yellow colors. And where we would expect the um, ASCC to be coming from the Bellingshausen, we have those cooler temperatures that flow um, south. It's largely lost down here um, towards Pine Island. Bay, but um, as it's picked back up in the sea surface temperatures um, along Thwaites. And it's probably um, around Pine Island Bay as well, but at the moment with the processing that I've done so far, um, you can't see those. But this gives us an idea of what that looks like. And if we compare that, that to an MIT G GCM output that Ola Kalin and others from our uh, Swedish group have worked on, um, we see similar patterns. The uh, model here was fed by iceberg tracks, ice, uh, sea ice drift, uh, wind velocities, and mooring ocean velocities from these moorings here. And the um, larger lines show what we would expect to see um, from the Antarctic coastal current. And those locations largely match up with the cooler regions that we see in MODIS. So um, what I'll show you next are transects um, from the Burke and Lindsay Island area. I also have data from Thwaites and Pine Island Glacier, but that wasn't worked up enough and we don't have a lot of time. But if you're interested, you can ask, and I do have some slides on those. So for the Burke Island transects, um, we had a glider transect here in black um, that I'm showing on the left and a shipboard CTD track shown in uh, red that's on the right. Um, for your orientation, these images are conservative temperature on the top and absolute salinity on the bottom. Uh, the western side um, is to the left and eastern on the right. Um, depth in all of these are from zero to 400 measures, meters, so we're only looking at the surface. And um, the left is February 11th from the ocean glider, right from the CTD. Um, each of the CTD um, stations is shown with these triangles and it's interpolated in between whereas the glider gets uh, continuous measurements across. So in general what we see between um, in February is the surface layer is a bit warmer um, with the cool uh, winter water below it and um, the modified circumpolar deep water um, below. And that is associated with uh, lower or fresher water at the surface. Um, and uh, especially freshwater uh, kind of south of Burke Island. By March, the surface has largely cooled off, um, but the density contours are largely the same as they were in February. Um, so there isn't a lot of difference. 
what we would be looking for to be able to constrain the Antarctic coastal current is these density contours coming to the surface. Um, and we're not sure that, that we've captured that within this, um, these transects. And that might be expected when we look at the um, sea surface temperature data because the Antarctic coastal current is likely to be coming at least to Burke Island, if not a little bit further. And um, so we can use sea surface temperatures to provide context for uh, our field measurements on whether we um, have captured the entire uh, length of what we're trying to observe. Um, we can also look at seasonal variability from seal tags, which is what I'm showing here. Um, this data is, is, is all pretty um, new results. And so you can see some blemishes in the data. And this tells you a little bit about how hard it is to work with seal tag data. Um, but also how um, useful this information is. Um, Burke Island and uh, is kind of in the middle of this um, data that I'm showing. And so uh, I've blocked out the data gap with these gray boxes. And I'll show you in the next, um, this slide and the next, the same location. And so what we see is a general cooler, um, water at the surface on the eastern side of this um, area, but on the western side of Burke, it's a little bit warmer. Uh, we see the density gradient uh, curve towards the surface pretty steeply, and that may be the edge of the Antarctic coastal current, but we're still working that out. Um, generally, we have the, the surface freshwater layer. Uh, if we go to, that was um, March, second and if we go to April, late April, what we've seen is that the surface has cooled significantly. Um, Actually, that's one minute. We also have um, the low salinity surface layer has largely diminished and we have a much um, more mixed surface layer and um, this is probably due to surface cooling, brine rejection from sea ice, winds, increased wind stress and reduced meltwater input. Um, but we can kind of get at that seasonal variability from the seal tag data. Um, just takes a, a bit more work. Um, so we're still working out those, um, those parts of the data. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about um, of where we're going with this data. And like I said, we've done, we're working on sections around Pine Island Glacier and around Thwaites. Um, all of this data together provides a really um, robust look at the Antarctic coastal current um, in ways that we haven't done that by including sea surface temperatures. So future work will also include the ADCP data. Um, I do an atmosphere or an air temperature correction to estimate upper ocean temperatures for um, the sea surface temperatures and that's based on some of the work that I'm doing in Greenland right now. Um, this is a, a plug that sea surface temperatures can provide key insights into ocean variability um, but they're widely um, underutilized around both of the ice sheets. And um, they also need calibration around, um, especially around Antarctica. So uh, any work that can be done on that would be great for making these data sets um, better, uh, more usable by the community. Um, on the right, I'm showing a picture of sea surface temperatures from Landsat in uh, Western Thwaites. So this is kind of a teaser to some of the imagery that we have to constrain the Antarctic coastal current there and some of the meltwater flowing um, out of Thwaites. So with that, um, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators and funding institutions. And please, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, it's Laurie Padman again. Um, so how often do you get SST in that area? Uh, sea surface temperatures um, can be viewed by um, Landsat every few days because we have lots of passes over the MNC, um, but cloud-free days are really difficult. Um, so some years you get almost no um, imagery and some years you can get imagery almost every or every other pass. So Landsat's repeat time is 16 days, um, but we can get it every every four days probably from Landsat if if everything was cloudless. So it it's a uh, it's it's difficult with the the temporal resolution. Much better for qualitative understanding for sure. 
Okay, thanks so much, Tasha. Um, at this point, we are into our discussion phase, and so I'll open up the floor to questions of any of the speakers from today. So there's a good conversation going on in the, I'm gonna turn on my camera so it's not just a face. Uh, there's a good conversation going on in the chat related to subglacial outflow, um, which I obviously think is very important, but I'd love to hear from the oceanographers because you're in oceanography speak over there in the chat. Uh, for glaciologists, like what kind of impact are we talking about, uh, Mike, potentially on the uh, circulation story and the iron story from subglacial meltwater, grounded ice subglacial meltwater. Okay, well, on the um, uh, BGC part of it, the dissolved iron part of the story, I think the biggest issue is we just don't know what the end member number is, and it could be huge. Um, as I was talking about in the chat, there was a paper a couple years back where they actually looked at it. They had a, a global model, um, circulation model with a um, BGC in it. They didn't have ice shelves in it, but they had just estimates of subglacial flux and they just put it in the grid cells next to the continent. And, you know, they used like a couple orders of magnitude estimates of the end member dissolved iron concentration. And if they used numbers that were, I think, relevant to measurements over um, blood falls near Mc, um, McMurdo, um, they could uh, fertilize the entire Southern Ocean with iron just from subglacial flux. Now, how much of that subglacial flux actually makes it out through the ice shelf cavities and near the open ocean, um, you know, there's a big physics question there too. I don't know how much of that gets entrained in the um, subglacial melt, uh, so the um, ice shelf basal melt plumes and as an easier pathway for it to get out into the open ocean. That's definitely an open question, but I think we're talking, I don't know, maybe a couple of orders of magnitude estimates that they used for the um, end member number. For the dissolved iron that is. Thanks, Mike. I think, I mean, I think for the more of the physics discussion, right? I've always assumed and I'd be more than welcome to be corrected that the actual, the actual volume flux, either just directly from the ice shelf melt or coming out as subglacial discharges, is probably pretty small compared to what is circulating through the cavity. But it's, I think that the interesting question is how it actually converts, well, I guess, I don't wanna call it unmodified circumpolar deep water, but circumpolar deep water that's accessed the cavity and converted it into something else. And, Presumably, if there's a lot of subglacial discharge, that, that mixing is more vigorous and you get a stronger overturning in the, in the cavity itself. And I, think that's, I do think that's important, right? Because that, that's going to, as Mike kind of talked about this, ice pump mechanism is going to pull more warm water in. Um, and I don't really know how you, you get at that. I don't know. I mean, I know in Greenland, they worry about that with tidewater glaciers all the time. I mean, that's... Um, what supposedly is driving all the big melt along those high water glaciers. I got to believe it's going to be somewhat similar, especially maybe some near some with the grounding lines where you have steep slopes. Andy, just to give you a, a sense of kind of the order of magnitude, the largest outflow or the largest inferred outflow from a subglacial lake uh, is, which would give you the, the largest flux. Uh, is about just over 200 cubic meters per second. So um, not insignificant, but not not like Greenland numbers. So how, how much was it again then? Uh, just uh, 227 cubic meters per second for okay. 10 months or something. So I think the typical order of magnitude for what oceanographers think might be going through the ice shelf cavity, and, and Mike could chime in on this, is maybe a tenth of a sort of drop at most, maybe a little bit less, but a tenth of a sort of drop is 10 to the fifth cubic meters per second. Yeah, I guess it depends where. Um, and if you, that's total flux. If you're looking at like basal melt flux, it's a bigger function or a bigger portion of that. Um, I vaguely remember something like um, 
I think Sasha Carter had estimates um, over the Seipel co Coast for the flux, and that was like about that volume flux was about one tenth of the volume flux estimated of basal meltwater from the base of the ice shelf. I had a question for Andy. The uh, seasonality, the coastal current close to the coast is at least uh, up in the Bellingshausen is fairly seasonal. Um, does that hold true as you head further south towards the Amundsen boundary? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think Rob alluded to this a little bit in the Rob Lauder in the chat. I think that seasonality signal decays. Uh, it, so I didn't really make this clear in my talk, but in the West Antarctic Peninsula, the, the forcing of the coastal current is mostly runoff. It is not sort of a, an outflow from a cavity, which we think is happening in the central Bellingshausen and then as Tasha showed in the, in the Amundsen. So the seasonality is pretty strong in the peninsula because it's, it's sort of that seasonal heating and, and runoff and that freshwater flux into the ocean. Um, we don't, to be honest, we don't really have the observations to know what the seasonality is doing. Uh, in the Western Bellingshausen, but one of the things that Rob uh, brought up is that um, when you get into the Western Bellingshausen, you have predominantly uh, northerly winds, and you get really packed and very thick ice that sits in front of Abbott and sort of in that boundary between the Bellingshausen and the Amundsen. And there's not, there's very little variability in the sea ice in there, and that presumably impacts surface properties. Um, I also think this, this uh, property of accumulation of meltwater as you move along the coast, which, which seems a pretty clear signature. And that's coming from, that is coming probably from this ice pump, right? The circulation in the cavity and the outflow, which is, is probably less susceptible to seasonality, both because it's a deeper process in the water column and it's integrating over the larger scale shell circulation. So my, my hunch is that you'll see the seasonality weaken as you go west. And we're, we're working on some numerical modeling to try to understand that. So you had uh, made a comment that some was entrainment and some was additional freshwater input as the current flows towards the west. Um, so the entrainment might also have a seasonal seasonality to it, right? It might, yeah, that's right. I, I think what I'm what I'm trying to argue there is so there's there's some some fraction of the increased transport in the coastal current is accumulating water that maybe originated at the shelf break, say in the Bellingshausen, flowed down these troughs that Yoshi showed, comes into the cavity, comes up, and now all of a sudden gets entrained and flows west. Um, I mean, we, these would be nice things actually to look at in Yoshi's model, but if that's the case, um, I think what I'm arguing there is that there's some time scale associated with the transport from the shelf break to the, to the ice shelf cavity, which might sort of degrade that seasonality. I think Mike's modeling has also shown significant seasonality in the basal melt rates. So there's a, at least for the, I guess, for the shallower shelves. Yeah, I'm having trouble unmuting. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, it, again, it varies from shelf to shelf, but there are some places um, where there is a significant seasonal variability. In, there, you know, there's observations of that actually now in some places. I had a question for Tasha. Um, I had the same question that Laurie had, which was how often you get these images, but how far back in time can you go? Um, so uh, Landsat 7 goes back to 2000 uh, or the end of 1999, um, but Landsat 7, predominantly wasn't taking images of Antarctica um, very often. Landsat 8 is when we started getting consistent imagery from Landsat, and that was in 2013. And then the MODIS imagery goes back to 2000. Um, and we have two MODIS instruments up. One went up in 2001, went out up in 2002. So that means that we have the opportunity to capture um, a lot more uh, imagery from clouds moving around because of that. 
I did have one comment about the sea surface temperatures in um, looking at that MODIS image that I had where it's slightly warmer in the middle of the um, Eastern Amundsen Sea and it kind of uh, related to your idea about heat, heat flux to the surface um, where we don't have the Antarctic coastal current so that stratification um, is what's causing that um, some of that variability between the AACC and the um, less stratified locations, which I think is pretty cool. I'd be curious to hear from each of the panelists, just stepping back for a minute, um, what your perspective is on kind of what the next frontier is in terms of thinking about how the ocean in West Antarctica is forcing grounding zones, maybe in particular in the Amundsen Sea, but um, what, what do we need to be doing better? What's the next big thing that, um, that y'all are gonna be thinking out about in order to tell us how Thwaites and Pine Island are gonna be changing moving forward? I'll jump in, maybe we'll go in order of the talks in. Um, I think one of the things that we've been trying to, to work on and, and I think is an interesting problem, not just for West Antarctica, is um, sort of remote forcing of different regions. So I think that's one of the, one of the things we're curious about of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. If uh, that has a big freshwater flux that's coming in from West Antarctica, how is that signal transmitted the Ballingshausen, the Amundsen, and maybe all the way to the Ross. And I think when you start thinking about that, the, the time scales that maybe has been a little bit lacking in terms of how we think about Antarctic dynamics because it's just hard is decadal. There's a lot of nice work on interannual variability and what controls the interannual variability and of course thinking about longer time scales. But that sort of decadal time scale is, is hard because often it depends on dynamics that require you to run very high resolution models but then run them for 10, 20, 30 years. And I think this sort of intersea, intersect shelf sea connectivity um, throughout the Antarctic margins is a really interesting question. How it, specifically how it links to melting in the ice shell cavities and that component of the circulation. I guess it's my time now. Um, I think, um, I mean, I, I think I quite pretty much agree with Andy, but I think one of one of the important things is to understand what are the mechanism that is controlling the ocean dynamic, ocean internal variabilities. And to do that one way, I mean, definitely we need observations at the same time. We have, we need the good models to, to, to capture or to, to be able to simulate these changes consistent with, with data. Uh, and then finally, we, I think we are able to analyze what are the cause the causality of, of the internal changes. And um, so my interests are to, to develop ocean model at the same time, the ocean state estimates, and try to understand what are the cause of the, the internal variability. And on top of that, what, what actually, if possible, what changed the Amundsen sea conditioning. For example, in the past from 1960s to now, you know, what changed from slightly colder states to warmer state. I think that's the ultimate questions for, for, for the community. Um, I guess it's my turn. One of the things, and we touched on it earlier, talking about the um, subglacial flux, is, and Andy touched on it too, is there's a lot of small scale stuff that may be important. And I think we have to figure out if it's important for larger scale models of the area, and how, if so, how we're going to parameterize that. Um, the subglacial hydrology may be important for BGC purposes. Um, it also may be important for physics purposes. Um, there's also this idea of, you know, um, troughs in the ice shelf itself. And subglacial flow may lead to channeling, channelization of the ice shelf melt. Um, and that could come out and lead to, and there have been papers talking about, you know, small scale polynies in front of ice shelves. Um, and that could be related to not only physics, but iron in those small scale channels getting out and causing hyperproductivity hyper um, in front of the ice shells, which is gonna feed back into the ecosystem. And how you parameterize that, I don't know, but I think it's something we need to um, figure out. Cool. 
Cool. Well, I guess I will follow up on all of that. Um, I think it's clear that we're starting to get a lot of observational data from some of these areas. There's still lots of areas that don't have that. And so we're finally being able to get at, you know, seasonal and interannual variability. Um, but I think want to kind of take a turn away from um, some of these oceanographic concepts. I think one of the ways into the future will be in how we expand um, on the engineering of some of our instrumentation and um, collaboration and um, produce more um, uh, inter, uh, interdisciplinary projects that kind of span all of these different areas. And I think that there's a ton of work left to do there that will be really interesting. And especially in, in the engineering realm, um, knowing a bit about some of you know, the oceanographic instruments we're still using, we could be uh, doing a lot more in terms of uh, cost and how easily um, it is to deploy some of these and, and whatnot and thinking about how our impacts are um, are going to be in the in the Antarctic based on some of that. So kind of my input there. Um, so we're at our time now. Um, so I'm going to wrap up if there isn't much else people can linger if they'd like to ask more questions, um, I guess, but we will, we do have this recorded, so it will be available if you missed any part. Thank you so much to our speakers. Um, we had a really nice session and uh, yeah, I guess we'll close that up. Thank you to Kaya also for um, co-convening.